A little while ago I made a video about how I designed and 3D printed this life-size Han Solo blaster based on the vintage Kenner figure, uh, vintage Kenner figure's weapon. And basically I sized it up so that it would be life-size, and I think it came out pretty well. Since then I've received a few requests from people to do various weapons, and one of the ones that seemed sort of most doable to me was the vintage Stormtrooper Blaster, which is actually used for a number of figures, including Boba Fett, by the way. Uh, I have one of them right here, so let's take a look at it. It's teeny tiny, although a little bit bigger than the Han Solo Blaster. Um, you know, for its small size, it's got quite a bit of detail on it. You can see, maybe if I can get close enough, that there's some cross-hatching on the handle here. It's got a number of details on there. So anyway, the point is, I want to try and recreate this one as well in life-size. And I'm going to use Tinkercad to do that, because that's basically the only thing I know how to do. <laughs> so, to the computer! So here we are in Tinkercad, and you can see this is actually the com completed model. Uh, instead of showing you how I built it up, I'm just going to sort of break it down a little bit and show you what it's made of. So. As I explained in my last video, in Tinkercad you use a bunch of geometric shapes like these over on the right to uh, combine them and make more complex shapes essentially. So if we take this and ungroup it, you can start to see some of the individual shapes this is made of. Uh, things like this barrel that goes down basically the entire body of the weapon is essentially just a cylinder that I've stretched out and turned on its side. The new Tinkercad uh, allows you to do things like bevel the edges or increase the number of sides and segments and things. So it allows you to round off things much nicer than you used to be able to in Tinkercad. So that's how I got these nice round edges here and on the edges here. These parts here, just to give you an idea, were these paraboloid shapes that I just stretched out made thin, you know, just, just sort of made it more or less the appropriate shape and size, and then you move it up into space, uh, into the place where you want it, and end up, in the end, grouping them all together. Uh, a couple things did give me some trouble, or at least they were more complex. One is the handle here, which you can see has a very interesting kind of crosshatch diamond pattern, which is my attempt at duplicating that crosshatching on the actual weapon actual toy. So if we ungroup it, we can see that actually what I've done is to make a cross-hatching of basically thin lines or thin segments to make the diamond pattern and then we made them into a hole, <clears throat> which is what Tinkercad says, you know, calls something that you can sort of use to cut away material. Make it into a hole and then when you combine it with this handle part, the parts that intersect are deleted and you just are left with this nice little pattern here which worked out surprisingly well I think. I'm not happy with the shape of the handle here because it's a little more curved on the actual thing, you know, it should sort of curve up here. But there are limitations to what we can do with Tinkercad. In fact, uh, one thing that I had to go to an outside program for was this wedge shape here on the side. Uh, I went through all of these shapes. I couldn't find one that really was appropriate, so I ended up using a wedge like this. And then, because this is very sharp, I exported it to just an STL file and used Mesh mix Mixer to smooth it all out and, and make it like this, which actually worked out pretty well. So yeah, this is the finished blaster model. I uh, knocked out the original design in not very long at all, two couple hours maybe, two three hours, but then I always find that getting the last 10% correct is always the hardest and it took a long time to get all of the proportions correct and everything like that, so this ended up being more involved than I had originally expected. Still, I'm pretty happy with the result. 
With the Han Solo blaster, I split it up into a number of pieces for printing, and that's because most people's printers probably can't handle something so large all at once, and also because it will look better if you split it up and optimize the facing of the parts so that you won't have to use support materials. And uh, so that worked out pretty well, but I decided, well, first of all, obviously, I knew that I was going to have to do the same thing for the Stormtrooper blaster because it's gigantic. And so I split it up into a number of pieces here, which is not a trivial thing to do in Tinkercad, by the way. It's, there's no actual function for doing this. What you have to do is, uh, well, I'll show you right here if I can do this. We'll bring this piece up and we'll just sort of ungroup it a few times to show you what's lurking under the surface. You can see there's actually like the whole half of the gun here. And I've just sort of masked off the pieces that I don't want with blocks of, uh, well, they're called holes, as I mentioned. And then you just join them together, and all that's left is the piece that you do want. And I had to do that for each of these pieces, which is a little tricky, but it's doable. Also, one thing I did that I have not done before is using this kind of peg to help align and uh, strengthen the joins. So I just made a little little peg that would go into these holes that I've placed and you know getting these holes to align with the parts can be a little tricky as well. I have them not, not just between the two halves of the gun but also sort of where these attach and where this attaches. So yeah, I wasn't sure if that was going to work out, but I decided to give it a try. And, uh, well, let's see how it actually turned out when I printed out the parts. It can be pretty tricky to figure out what size these should actually be when they're life-sized. In this case, I made it the same size as the actual Stormtrooper Blaster prop from the movie, so it's about 20 inches long. I printed this at 0.3 layer height, 0.3 millimeters so that it would be relatively rough but also print in a reasonable amount of time and I figured I could smooth out the layer lines later on using sanding and filler primer. And here we have all the printed parts. I'm not entirely sure how long all of these took to print but I'm guessing around 20-ish hours and uh, they all came out pretty well I think especially considering the rough setting that I used. Here we have the holes on the bottom for the pegs, and we have a peg here that I printed separately. It can be a little tricky to get the sizing for this right. You don't want it to be too tight, so you can't get the pegs in. But, of course, you don't want them to be rattling around in the holes. And let's see. Whoop, that's not the right piece. <laughs> let's see here. How does this fit together? I think this is it. Wrong side. There we are. So, yeah, we have them all fit together thusly. So of course the pieces would fit together like this, and you can see one minor issue with these very long pieces is that there's been a little bit of warping on the bed so that they don't fit together entirely flush. Uh, this would have been much worse in the past, by the way, when I was having bad warping problems. Now it's not so bad, and I can actually fix this just by clamping the pieces together with the glue. And if there's a little tiny bit left, I can use some Bondo to fix that as well. I did notice one problem after I got everything printed is that one peg hole is sort of interlocking with another peg hole which means of course you can't fit two pegs in the same space so I just left one peg out of there. Here's the gun all together. I just used some super glue to put it together but I made sure and used some sandpaper to rough up all the surfaces that would be going together and I find that really helps. You can see that the warping issue is essentially gone here and really all the way along the gun there's hardly any problem with the pieces not fitting together properly. Definitely get some clamps to uh, get the pieces to, to join together properly. Now you can see here the rough setting that I used resulted in some of these layers being very visible. I could have, as I said, used a finer setting to print this with, and these would have been much less prominent. But it would have taken maybe two or three times as long to print. So I wanted to try this out and see if I could use uh, sanding and filler primer and all of that stuff to get rid of these and not have to take so long to print. So this is again a kind of a, an experiment to some degree. I tried using this little mouse sander to sand parts of it. I figured the 
curved parts might not work very well, but it actually worked okay, I think. I also did some hand sanding just with sandpaper and with a sanding block. I was just trying to make sure I got all of the most egregious uh, layer lines out before I started the priming process. I used some Bondo spot putty to fill in some of the cracks or the parts where the pieces joined together, and I have cunningly arranged to have all of this occur off screen so you can't see it. But just imagine me smearing red paste all over the thing and you'll get the idea. Then there was more sanding, both with the mouse sander and by hand. And finally I ended up with something like this. Now you can't really tell from looking at this, it doesn't look that great. But if you were to feel it, you can feel that the layer lines were largely gone. And that's the important part. So next step was to prime it. As usual, I used a high build filler primer, which will fill in all of the minor imperfections and hopefully smooth the layer lines so that they won't be so obvious. Uh, spraying the primer on the first time really makes it obvious where some of the problems are, where the layer lines are still too prominent, or where there's a, an obvious seam or something like that. So it allows you to go and pay more attention to those areas when you're sanding. This is a good example of what I was just talking about. You can see, if you look closely, all the layer lines that are still present there, even after doing an initial sanding and uh, priming. So still had a lot of work to do at this point. Back to sanding. Yeah, you, this filler primer is actually pretty impressive stuff because it will fill in a lot of the gaps and layer lines, but you do have to put some elbow grease into it and uh, really smooth it out. And it does clog up your sandpaper really quickly, so that's a bit of a problem too. But after a while, I found that I was able to get it relatively smooth, so I did a, another prime coat. So after putting another coat of primer on and then sanding that down, I had what was a relatively smooth blaster. It's not perfect, but uh, I was actually fairly fairly happy with it. And the final step was just to spray paint it this navy blue color. It came out pretty well, I think. I did have a few little issues with minor imperfections in the paint where I had maybe not waited long enough for it to dry before turning it over and going for the next coat. And I did have to respray a few places. But I think overall, it came out quite well. And here we have the finished product. It's uh, it's really quite large, so it's a little difficult to get into frame here. I have to reach <laughs> pretty far to be able to hold it, but uh, you, know, you can get an idea of what it looks like here. I uh, wasn't totally pleased with how the finishing process turned out. Now again, I'm using this, like the previous one, a bit like a test for my R2-D2 project to see just how much finishing, or a lack thereof, I can get away with and still have a good end result. And I think maybe in this case I could have done a little bit more. Uh, you may not be able to tell from far away. In fact, it looks pretty good from a reasonable distance, but if you look closer up, you can see here there's a little seam, which you can see not from every angle maybe, but from some angles where the, the parts join up. And, and also here there's a little seam. Uh, there's a couple of blemishes in the paint where I kind of rested it against something while I was trying to paint the other side and I guess the, the paint wasn't completely dry so that was a little too bad but for the most part I would say it turned out really well especially like the handle here I'm pretty proud of this effect even though the shape of the handle itself is a little too squared off and here I think I got all the main features that you really need for this blaster Although you can see, in a few places, traces of the layer lines still left, even after sanding and multiple, you know, passes with the filler primer and everything and all of that good stuff. But uh, I think it came out uh, pretty well. Now I do have this model in pieces available for you on Thingiverse if you wanted to try and make it yourself. I also have smaller versions of them. Uh, if you want to make, for example, a keychain like this one, <laughs> which is, of course, a much smaller version of the same model. This one actually prints in 
two halves, which you can see here, that just you can just super glue together, and uh, much simpler than trying to use support. Luckily, this this model happens to be just the way it is. Uh, it, it's symmetrical enough that you can just slice it down the middle, and we'll be fine. I also, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put up a just a full unbroken model in case anyone wants that as well. One thing I was saying about this is that it's kind of a learning experience, and that's true in terms of the finishing, but it's also true in terms of the modeling as well. I am not any kind of modeler, really. I'm just totally self-taught and just been messing around in Tinkercad on my own. But I think I've come a fair way since I first started, and in fact I think I'm going to be moving on to something like uh, Fusion 360. It's a more advanced and powerful program. But uh, I'm pretty pleased with what I've been able to accomplish just with something like Tinkercad, which is pretty limited in many ways, but uh, still, you know, it, it just goes to show that even if you don't have any experience with 3D modeling or really any kind of design, that you can teach yourself to do it and make your own props and models and things like that. So anyone watching who maybe thinks that they aren't able to do this kind of thing, I think you can. Uh, it just takes some practice and, you know, I, I've been doing this for a little over a year since I started 3D printing, really, but not uh, intensively in any way at all. Just, you know, whenever the fancy strikes me, I would try and design something. Or I also did a lot of sort of altering of existing designs and things just to see if I could make them a little bit better or easier to print or whatever. And so, yeah, I think that's really paid off. So, I, once again, check the description below for the link to the Thingiverse page with these models available. I'm not going to be giving away keychains this time, unfortunately. I just I can't afford to keep doing that, but maybe I will do another giveaway at some point in the future. In the meantime, thanks very much for watching.